I guess we are just waiting for Adam to join and start the meeting. Yeah, a Adam said he's going to be a little late, so uh, we can start with Adam. Uh, yeah, I think like if he's planning to be a little late, I guess. I guess we can get started. If you if you're fine with that, Alexander. I actually had a topic, but I'm struggling to share screen. If somebody could bring up the the Google Doc for this, I could start with my topic. Let me see if I can make that happen. Yeah, I tried sharing as well, and mine mine doesn't work either. See, you are sharing screen, but I don't see here anything. Uh, yeah, I see it. Yeah, scroll down a little bit. It's there. It's the five six. Let's let's see. So we can see the screen, but if you could just scroll a little bit down. Is there anything happening? I don't, I don't see anything. For me, the screen is sort of blank. All, all I see is the message that you are sharing your screen. Oh, OK. So, but you can, I'm, I'm trying to scroll it up and down. Do you see any movement or it's just frozen? <laughs> no, it's just frozen. OK, I guess you can start with your topic anyway. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, right, so my topic is about um, the tokens we give out on cross namespace cloning. Um, what I saw today is that somebody with a disconnected environment was uh, doing like a smart clone or CSI clone, and they were failing because of the token uh, expiring after five minutes. And it got me thinking that there may not be a good reason to not have extended tokens. Um, I know we have uh, really long-term tokens for host-assisted clones, um, but I'm not sure if there's security implication in just giving out the same token to smart CSI clones, basically all clones. So yeah, given yeah. the current uh, way cloning works, um, unless there is some, I don't, I didn't look at this issue or know what's going on, but um, given the current design, a namespace transfer res with smart cloning, the namespace transfer resource can get created early on, um, even so that gets created early before like the source even exists or is populated. So the, the assumption is that that resource can get created within that five minutes. And once that exists, there, there should be no need for a um, long-term token unless that gets deleted or um, something keeps it from getting created within five minutes. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense then. Uh... Yeah, I wonder what, what I saw in that disconnected environment today. Uh, maybe they weren't doing cross namespace, but then tokens are not necessary. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, let's... this is all going to change soon anyway. With uh, As we're working on the populators, there, there will be a long-term token all the time for the new, um, since we're, the way we're doing things is changing a bit. So yeah. yeah. Uh, Pretty soon there will always be a, a, a long-term token. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it, it, it shouldn't be needed given the current implementation. As long as that namespace transfer is created within five minutes and it should be in normal cases and it's not deleted. 
yeah i doubt it's deleted but i'll keep looking for any other errors in that case yeah i mean if yeah i guess you know if if the cdi controller isn't running or something it doesn't receive the initial request within five minutes it would fail but yeah i understand that it's pretty unorthodox anyway um oops muted sorry that that's all for my topic adam is back now i think so adam it's all yours and see if the screen sharing works for you i tried screen sharing and but yeah okay i was just gonna thanks yeah i was just gonna ask uh yeah. i was gonna ask if you will release the screen i can yeah i'll credit. release the screen uh so i did that and give it a try hopefully it will work for you yep thank you let me try here um and thanks for getting started without me let's see yeah it works all right Cool. All right. Thanks. All right. So let's go on to the next topic that I see here, which belongs to you, Arnon. Why don't you just dive right in? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So uh, it started about a week ago, I think, uh, in an internal uh, uh, thread uh, regarding uh, GitOps. But uh, I think it's a generic uh, issue. As Michael already mentioned, we will move to populators in the near future. So we're uh, not sure this uh, it should be that dramatic, but let's discuss it a few minutes. Uh, OK, so basically, it started that, uh, uh, by the case that uh, applying a garbage collection, uh, garbage collected the data volume, uh, will basically fail. Uh, uh, it is uh, rejected by uh, our validation uh, webhook uh, because there is already uh, a PVC with the CV name, uh, which is a uh, wrong logic in that case of garbage collection, and it breaks the uh, basic principle uh, of Kubernetes uh, of uh, CR dependency. And it's also a must for uh, GitOps, which uh, uses the apply mechanism and expects the data volume or any other uh, uh, CR to exist after it applies, applied. Now, uh, the initial response in the thread was uh, just to disable the uh, GC as a, a it's about it's a default for about half a year or a year something like that um, which will uh, get us back to the state where we've been before it and uh, the item potency will be uh, perfect because that way you can apply the dv uh, again and again at, uh, and as it's the same uh, it will succeed for sure um, Alexander mentioned in the thread that uh, uh, disabling GC may cause some uh, uh, regressions in Valero uh, Restore. I'm not sure, maybe Alexander can ex explain about it in, in a minute. Uh, and we also uh, mentioned the initial motivation for uh, GC. Uh, I think all of them are not relevant when we move uh, to uh, uh, populators, but uh, you have the link here. I mentioned that uh, for a long time, all our uh, CI lanes are uh, using uh, uh, the GC default, uh, both in CDI and Qubit. So switching, uh, just changing the default uh, uh, may cause us some noise. Um, what else? Oh, I suggested that PR uh, trying to solve this issue. Uh, Michael was not that happy about it, but uh, there is an open discussion there. Uh, I hope we can uh, agree on something. Uh, I'd like to hear your voices about it. 
what do you think we should do? How should we progress to try to uh, battle this uh, uh, issue and solve it in a PR, which as far as I understand is uh, solvable, or uh, go with disabling uh, garbage collection by default? I would say that when I start using uh, CDI, I was pretty confused by the fact that DVs are automatically deleted after import is completed. Uh, that was so surprising for me because no other entities in Kubernetes are not working this way. And why this uh, design was uh, chosen for implementing this feature. So yeah, we also had this problem, but we used uh, Is we it made the same for job, for example. What? Is Sorry. it the same for job in Kubernetes? Uh, no, job is not removed automatically in Kubernetes. Okay. It's continue existing, uh, or there might be some job controller which is creating those jobs and they removing them. Okay. But yeah, I. I agree that DV is more likely jobs which should be deleted after importing. I think it might be named a uh, different way like data volume import jump or something like that. But never mind. Uh, we already have what we have. And I would represent that DVs are should continue existing uh, anytime. After you imported it, uh, I think it should, I think it should be, uh, should continue existing. That somehow confusing that they're removing. But by, by the way, it was the first time you used CDI, garbage collection was already there, right? Uh, there were problem. Yeah, yeah. But uh, this garbage collection is works also works also kind of weird to me because we uh, rule the DVs by the upper entity. So we introduced our own entities which are creating uh, DVs and these DVs are control, controlling uh, PVs and all this stuff. So when we set uh, OVNI reference for data volume, they will not get garbage collected by the garbage collection. You, you mean Which is also unpredictable. Uh, no, uh, for example, I have uh, upper resource like virtual okay. machine disk or virtual machine image. And when I create this resource, it creates data volume. And for this data volume, it creates, it sets uh, OVNI references to upper resource. And if DV has this OVNI reference, it's continue existing even after it completed. Actually, in uh, OpenShift, we use the same. Uh, uh -huh. And this, exactly the same uh, logic. And uh, the DV saga, which collected, have a virtual machine reference to data volume. And then uh, <clears throat> when the data volume. Uh, no, he's talking about some other resource owns the data volume, yeah. and then and yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, and in this case, we don't garbage collect them because we can't set. Uh, we don't like have per per permissions necessarily to set uh, oh, okay. the, the 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 um the finalizer for that resource. Um, so so it, I, I think this is just I another just... example of of yeah these weird edge cases and. <clears throat> unexpected behaviors with garbage collection. Okay. Exactly. And the only thing I wanted to point is unexpected behavior. And every time it is different, I would like to have just one. If it's job, then it should be job. And it should be pos positioned like job. If it's a resource which you can use and connect later to the troll machine, then it should continue existing. Why it removed? Yeah, so I think um, one of the main motivations for introducing this was for the backup and restore case where we had some complications when trying to restore. And when you restore a data volume, there could be a race condition if the PVC, uh, depending on the ordering, if the PVC has already been restored, then it would work one way. And if the PVC was not there, then our DV controller would try to create that PVC fresh and re-import. So 
the idea which which uh, led to this was, oh, well, let's garbage collect the data volume so that we're just dealing with PVCs because that's all that really matters after it's imported. So I think this was the idea. Um, and what I would say is I believe that we're finding that uh, this idea has resulted in some collateral damage, which I think seems to be, and what I'm seems to be borne out by by uh, your experience as well is that it's actually causing more confusion than it's clearing up. Um, we also handle the data volume case correctly with the Valero plugin that we released. So it's kind of a solved problem for the time being. Um, and the long-term solution really is to, uh, to move beyond data volumes and be using PVCs and populators directly. So I think we've tried to take, I think we've just to summarize myself, like data volumes have never fit as cleanly into the Kubernetes uh, world as we would have liked. And we're finding this out and trying to correct course. But, uh, so, you know, we took a couple of attempts to try to solve that, uh, one of which was garbage collection. I, I'm not sure that it's turning out to be the, <clears throat> the you know, the panacea we thought it might be. Yeah, and one of the main motivations was that once you've done importing, the data volume really has no role anymore. So in that <clears> regard, <throat> it's it's very much like a job where you know, once the job completes, the actual job resource doesn't do anything. So mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, so we're kind of left with this technical debt, if you will, uh around data volumes. So I guess I guess uh, we should take a decision here. Whether to we need to take a decision now, uh, I think, or as soon as possible, whether to disable it and uh, try to minimize the effects on the lanes, uh, or try to solve it somehow. What what is the uh, so what is the state of it upstream? Is it on by default in a default CDI deployment, or is it off by yeah. default? Okay, it's on by default both upstream in CDI Everywhere. and in the okay. Kubert. So I will point out one of the issues that's mentioned in the PR, which uh, it was cool to see that come out so quickly in responses. There is a use case where. Uh, so th this PR makes it so that when you recreate a DV, when there was a garbage collected one, it just puts the DV back and doesn't do anything different. Um, but I think it is a valid use case when somebody, um, like we do want this check to stop you because people could get confused if they if there's a PVC around, they looked for the DV, it's not there. So they're like, okay, I need to create this. Um, they create the DV. Um, but it just binds to the old PVC that was lying around. Um, so I think this is a potential to create additional confusion because it's now doing something special in another way. And it seems, feels like a slippery slope because then we'd have to correct that. Um, so I think to me, it's it pains me that um, a lot of great work was done to enable garbage collection, to enable this idea. It pains me that we may have to uh, essentially revert that functionality, but sometimes this happens. And I think the best way might just be to cut our losses and turn it off. Um, I think the easiest way to do that would be to switch it upstream uh, in the CI lanes, um, turning it off, but leave it on for a little while in the deployment, uh, the default deployment so that we can iron out any issues and then we could turn it off by default there upstream as well. I don't know if that makes sense. I mean, assuming we want to do that, I'm that's presuming that it's should the, be done. Uh, great. Can can I just point uh, one more issue with DVs that uh, data, data volume spec is immutable and it still contains the requested storage size for the PVC. In this way, user can be confused by the fact that he can't actually resize the data volume. Yep. 
this was another the motivations to garbage collect the data right because we didn't we didn't want to basically make the dv um a pass through for everything you can do with a with a pvc because then people would start to say well i want to snapshot this dv so why can't i you know and then we'd have to implement that api so essentially we wanted to say once the the data volume is done populating its work is done it's now essentially a dead resource and then you should be manipulating the pvc directly we tried to enforce that by garbage collecting the dv but yeah like we said that's confusing so this is another one of those issues where the the dv just doesn't fit very well into kubernetes as it turns out but yeah it's good that you raised that because that was definitely an, an issue okay so i think we'll continue uh, the discussion after this meeting because uh, I want to minimize the risks here. Uh, you know, it's both in the CDI and Kubevert, so we need to think how to do it the uh, safe, the safest way. Well, Kubevert should be able to handle basically if the DV, because the way that that's implemented is if the DV is not there, we look at the PVC to see if it. Uh, referenced that DV and then we accept it, but if the yeah, DV is there, it should just not go down that that path. Theoretically, you, you're right, but uh, you know, it's not tested in the case where DV is not garbage collected. So we need to see that there are no uh, no either there. Mm -hmm. I think that safest way for now is to disable garbage collection because a uh, user will get the behavior, expected behavior that he's creating DV is get imported and then he can use it as well. He can use the PVC, but in case if he wants to resize it. Yeah, for example, uh, you can create Persistent volume claim, and you can create persistent volume in different storage class, and they will get bound. So, what's a problem that you don't allow user to modify size? I think on these two facts are somehow similar. So, anyway, uh, user is secured um, by the fact that he can't edit the size for already created DV, and I think this is not a problem. Mm -hmm. That's just about pos positioning of data volume. If we say that data volume is just initial PVC, then it is. But other question is, should we create owner reference of PVC from the data volume or not? What dead standard behavior for now? I'm not sure about that. Yeah, I mean, we we like the deletion chain to work uh, correctly, like the cascading delete. So this is the primary reason for the owner reference. Yeah, I mean, uh, what the behavior should be if user removes uh, data volume, should it, should it remove PVC itself? I mean, this is the, the traditional and expected behavior since the DV created the PVC. Yeah, I mean, that's like, you can manually delete that owner reference, but um, typically th this was the, the desired approach, especially when you're using a data volume template section um, in the VM, because that's intended to be um, coupling the disk resource uh, with the VM so that when you delete the VM, its disks are removed. So this is like traditional behavior that we wouldn't want to change. Mm -hmm. Then it is. So hopefully, I mean, what I would say is that uh, hopefully you would review what's happening with what we're doing with populators. Um, and even try to use the standalone populators when those come out. I see that uh, it looks like Alexander added uh, this next item, which we I guess we can kind of jump to um, that includes the populators. And so I think the way of the future is to use those directly. Um, 
there are some things that the data volume, some conveniences the data volume provides to you that are um, are would be missing from populators directly, in particular the storage profiles and kind of allowing you to uh, to omit access mode and volume mode, uh, among other things. Um, but it, I think it'd be great to have some folks trying those populators uh, standalone uh, to help us. Because um, what we're trying to do is smooth over these uh, these rough edges as we go forward, even working towards the CDI 1.0 API. Um, so let's make sure we get it right together. Um, and sorry, I kind of uh, stole your thunder a little bit, Alexander. So is there anything else that you wanted to mention about this release? No, I, I just wanted to say that we, we did release the first alpha of uh, 157 mainly so that we could import the API in Kubevert so that Kubevert would you know, work properly with all the different phases. Um, but you know, people can try it. Um, this release does not have integration between data volumes and populators. It's just the standalone populators. Um, that's why it's the alpha release. If there are any uh, examples how to use populators or from the user side, is there anything changed? Uh, I would like to see. It's about creating PVC with specified. Yeah, you, I'm not sure how it works. Uh, did we make any examples in the documentation? I don't think we I have. hope so. I hope so. I don't think we it. have yet. Uh, I think there's just documentation in, in the, the PRs and um, yeah, I don't think we have any docs upstream yet. Um, I just did, want yeah. to make a couple notes on this release and populators in general. Um, uh, the general note is that uh, it, yeah, we put some populators out there and um, you, you can use them. There is a one bug we found uh, over the weekend. Uh, so we'll probably um, do another release to fix that. Basically PVs aren't getting cleaned up correctly. Um, but the other kind of bigger note is that uh, Kubernetes cross namespace data source is still alpha. And until that's beta, um, you're gonna have to use data volumes to do cross namespace uh, cloning. Um, just leveraging our weird token mechanism that we talked about earlier. Um, so until until uh, Kubernetes is beta on cross namespace data source, we're going to be have to use data volumes for cross namespace cloning. And then I guess the other thing, which is due to be released soon, is the data volume integration. So what that means is that when you do use data volumes. Uh, as part of your workflow, it's going to uh, transparent to you under the covers, uh, create PVCs that are populated using the populators. Um, so it's kind of exercising it that way. And uh, it's supposed to be transparent to the end user. Um, another thing that we'll definitely be wanting to get uh, feedback from the community in terms of how that's working for your particular use cases. Um, make sure that it's still working. That's not really supposed to change anything in terms of the experience with the data volume, right? So. Just note the alpha release does not have that integration yet. So. Right, so that's coming coming soon. Am I right that right now, is there just one populator for cloning PVCs? Uh, there is, so there is a volume clone source, which is a, a yeah, it's, it will do, um, well, at least the one that was released was just for PVCs, but we just mm -hmm. merged the code for doing snapshots as well. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So I think this is, this is again, very preliminary. I, I, uh, again, th there's at least one major bug and it's very incomplete. I, I, uh, use at your own risk. <laughs> um okay uh, i just would like to know about the flow yeah so basically work. we have um a bunch of 
custom resources um, that you can create. Like uh, I'll, I'll try to find my PR, um, but it should give an example of um, how to use it. And there is an import populator and an upload populator as well. So the yeah. populators will cover the full suite of operations, but the major caveat that Michael mentions is that cross namespace cloning is it does not work directly uh, with the populator itself. You need some of that special secret sauce from the, the data volume controller to achieve that um, for the time being, but that should, that should be remedied uh, with that cross namespace populators API from Kubernetes when it graduates. Yeah. So if you look at the link I posted, the, the PR description should have an example of how to use the, um, I found only PVC clone, a uh, populator upload, a populator and import populator yep. does not, do not have any examples in a uh, PR description, but I think I can try to find it in tests. Yeah, and this is something this is something uh, we should remedy uh, if we're gonna like. I granted, I kind of jumped out here and said we want people to try it, and at the moment, it's a bit of an internal implementation detail. But we, I think it is since we're discussing these pain points around data volumes. It's really I would love to have uh, earlier Got feedback it. from you guys. So. But the, the PR description that I posted at least has an example of manifest that will do populator with, from a PVC source. Well, I, I think it's sort of reasonable for us to not have documentation on this yet because we don't actually have a release that contains it. So, mm -hmm. you know, we tell people, hey, this, this is how you do it, but there's no code that actually does it. It's sort of... Right, so you create this first uh, CR uh, is, uh, it's basically the part, you, you'll recognize the syntax from the data volume. It's basically specifying uh, the clone that you wanna do a clone, and then you just create a PVC directly and you use the Kubernetes populators API, the data source ref to say that uh, populate using uh, the CR that you created above, and then that's how how it works. It's going to definitely be more native uh, to the way Kubernetes is working. So, uh, but also just remember that we're we're aiming to ensure that if you just continue to use data volumes the way that you are today, it should you shouldn't notice this. It's meant to be transparent. Yeah, so the data volume integration will create a temporary volume clone source resource for each operation and then delete it once uh, it's complete. So it should, at the end of the day, you'll still just have um, PVC in a data volume. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else on on those topics? Yeah, I just uh, going back to the previous one, maybe a little bit. I think yeah, Vaps mentioned uh, perhaps a bit of confusion about having a data volume around and the PVC around and like mutable fields like the um, requested size. Uh, I, Maybe I missed it, but what were your thoughts on that? Like, do you think that, for example, the um, size in the data volume should mirror what is in the PVC? So if, if a user updates the data volume, we update the PVC size. Is that what you would expect? Or is the current behavior fine where it's sort of just um, static and never changes? Okay. I think he's typing the uh, this other agenda item. So. Yeah. 
Can I? <laughs> uh, right. So would you? Um, so I just wanted to see. Did you want an opportunity to answer Michael's uh, question as well? He was curious about what you would expect the uh, data volume behavior to be when the size is updated. My uh, opinion on that. Or uh, sorry, yeah, I didn't get yeah, this. yeah. We're asking yeah, for, so, your, for your opinion. Yeah, so I'm wondering that in the case where you know the data volume is not garbage collected, the data volume is there. What should should the um, should basically should users be able to update the size in the data volume, or at least have the data volume like requested size be mirrored somehow or like or or yeah i mean just what your expectations are from the data volume resource when it's just okay sort of code uh, I, can, thing. I can say a little bit about that we are developing our own HTTPs uh, for users to let them manage the images and drives for their vms and we let our users to update size inside them. Like we have our own uh, abstraction, like data volume. It's called virtual machine image or virtual machine disk. And if user update size, it also updates the PVC size. And I think this is pretty understandable for every user. Yes, uh, he can update the size on PVC directly. But our controller just checks if the size of PVC greater than uh, size of data volume or our own abstraction. And in this way, it will do nothing. But I think it's nice to have this opportunity to update the size from DB side. OK, so uh, in your case, you don't, um, the size represented in your resource is not a direct. Um, directly the value. So if the user updates the PVC directly, it won't necessarily update your resource. But if the size requested in your resource is bigger than the PVC, you'll update the PVC. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think it is pretty understandable because spec is always represents uh, what they expected, uh, what the user needs. So first time user specifies that he needs some data volume with specific source, for example, Ubuntu image, and he needs this size for let this image be uploaded. And other case, when he wants to extend this drive, he can extend this drive directly by modifying uh, data volume spec. Yeah, it's a little, I. I... I think that makes sense. It's also a little like two ways to do the same thing, which is generally not great, but I, I think I get it. I think that makes sense. Another thing uh, is what to do if user wishes to update storage class. In this way, I think we have to do nothing because the upstream logic in Kubernetes does the, actually the same thing. If you create, for example, stateful set and specify one storage class name, and then you try to update it, it will not, uh, first it will not let you do that. But if you remove storage stateful set and create another one, it will just continue consuming existing persistent volume claim with uh, different storage class, with old storage class specified. Uh. So I'm just, as far as like changing a storage class in a PVC, from my understanding, that's only, you can only do that if there's what, no default storage class in the cluster. Like, so on the PVC directly, like when is storage class mutable? I think it's a very limited time, right? Yeah, yeah. It, I think it's only when there's no, default storage class so the um so so even even if there is no storage class specified i guess you have no opportunity or maybe you have an opportunity to assign this field 
but I thought that all spec of PVC is immutable as well, except the size. No, sorry, I'm lying to you. <laughs> I don't remember this. Yeah, I think I think that storage class is only like really updatable if like the PVC is kind of pending because it couldn't get assigned if if it's nil and um it couldn't get assigned a storage class um during provisioning because there's no default storage class then you can update yeah, it later i think that's the only time storage class like on a pvc can be updated and then updating storage class in the data volume you know Yeah, I guess for that small window, we could make it happen. Um, but it, it is, I think, storage class updates are, um, the, there's a small window there for, for when we can, that's valid. Yeah, this is, this is kind of the road we started going down with mutable fields, you know, because then we tried to tried to wonder what it would be like if you updated the source part of the DV and what the proper behavior should be. And it just starts to get uh, a little complicated and not always clear. So really, we I think we sort of left it at the data volume was a, was a proxy for the PVC object. And, um, but we did stop short of allowing you to update the size. I sort of hesitate to per start permitting that because we really are trying to deprecate the data volume. So like not adding a lot of new capability there. Um, but yeah, it's that one's a little cut and dried, but the rest of it, not so much. All right. Um, Shall we move on uh, to the block-based QCOW2 drives just to give you a chance to bring that topic up? We've only got about five or so minutes here, so. Well, uh, okay, I'll try. Uh, first, I would say that I would like to start the new project, which will uh, make available to use shared Loon devices. Like you have a shared block device, you can use LVM to cut it for the virtual machines. And I need QCO support for this uh, approach. Mm -hmm. And I found that OVIRT uses actually the next approach. It writes QCO files directly on block devices. And I was thinking, uh, how can we reuse this pattern in QVIRT? Because in QVIRT, we're always expecting from CDI the block device itself or file system where we can place QCO files. If you have any thoughts on that, please go ahead. Yeah, so we've, we've discussed um, some, of, some of these ideas in the past. And one idea that would actually be super interesting to see an implementation for is um, container disks that are uh, smarter, like uh, a, a smart kind of container disk. And what I mean by this is, uh, today, when you look at a PVC, um, we are looking if it's, well, if it's a file-based one, we're looking for a disk.img file. And if it's uh, block-based, we're just accessing it directly. But container disks uh, being file-based, um, we were thinking it could be interesting that if we add it and we add a capability to the container disk where if the disk.img file is not there, we could look for a uh, NBD socket in the container disk or something like that and basically teach kubevert that if you don't find the disk.img file, you just connect to the NBD socket. Uh, when that exists, then your container disk can basically implement the uh, the connection to the device in any way that you would want to. So if it's a QCOW2 file underneath, that's fine. Um, if it, yeah, basically whatever it is. Um, so this was an idea that we thought was interesting because then we don't have to teach uh, Kubevert about like different ways of constructing these. And it doesn't necessarily need to be container disk uh, specific either. It could just be uh, essentially anytime uh, Kubevert connects to a PVC that's uh, 
the registered as file base. Now you mentioned block. I don't know how we could nece necessarily make that generic, although with a container disk, I guess you could because you could have the container disk attached uh, or with the capability to talk to a certain block device. So anyway, I don't want to take a ton of time, but this was one idea that was kicked around in this area. Mm -hmm. The other question is how to teach. Uh, well, there is a problem of this approach. If you're going to use Kiko files on top of LVM without mm -hmm. file system itself, there is a big question how to extend them. Uh, the design of Ovirt, uh, he makes libvirt handler, which notifies uh, when the size, specific size, allocation size is reached. So it mm -hmm. has time to ex extend this drive. Yeah. And in case of Kubevirt, there is no opportunity to do that because uh, it's like two separate components. One is CSI driver which yep. can handle this extension. And the second one is the libvirt, which runs inside the virt launcher. Yeah, so this is 100% by design uh, because these uh, these logic, uh, it's tight, tightly coupling the virtualization layer with the storage layer. And uh, as soon as you start to go down that road, uh, things get complicated really quickly um, and it makes it difficult. You know, you have to have lots of storage specific logic within the vert layer. Um, mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. there is a project uh, called uh, QSD, the QMU storage daemon, and it's actually a CSI driver um, that's being worked on. I don't have a link for you right now, but maybe someone else on the call does. And this driver essentially, so they have uh, QMU can actually run in a mode where you're really just running the IO layer of QMU and mm -hmm. um, you know exposing devices uh, for consumption by another layer. So you can actually have a, this is something that could be implemented in QSD, for example, because QSD could receive the like it can know when the device is full and at that level and then handle that uh extension itself so and that Amazing. still preserve that okay. still preserves the isolation between uh the vert layer and the storage layer because all of that could be hidden uh inside of a csi driver itself got it thank you thanks a lot i'll take a look at the la la uh, latest question Mm -hmm. is how Kubeert handling QCO files right now. I haven't seen that. I saw that it can use the both. It can work with Q2, Q, Q2 and sorry, QCO2, and it can work the same with raw files if they placed in file system data volumes. Uh, is there any opportunity to specify what, what type of this drive is that? Um, so, so Someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I know, we're making the assumption of raw. And uh, if I remember correctly, if you want to use QCOW2, you have to state it in the domain XML. And that's for security reasons, because you can construct a, someone can construct a, um, a QCOW2. They can basically fake the QCOW2 metadata and, and trick Libvirt into accessing it. Uh, in order to basically grant access to parts of a, a device that should not be accessed, uh, like to bypass permission. So um, mm -hmm. basically, if you want to use QCOW2, you have to put it in the domain XML. And as far as I know, we are not providing uh, uh, an API to specify that yet. The only case where we're actually accessing it as a QCOW2 file is in the contain, like the ephemeral container disk case. Um, but I could Got be it. I could be slightly wrong with that. Um, we're not fundamentally opposed to the QCOW2 format, but mostly we don't want to support um, uh, QCOW2 chains, um, like uh, backing files and su su such in the yep. primary API yet. So, but again, this is something that I would suggest if you follow that approach where you have the container disk that has the NBD socket in it. Um, you can put whatever you want behind that NBD socket. It could be a chain of 100 file, QCOW2 files that are put together by whatever method your uh, deployment wants to, to do. Um, 
as a method of experimentation. So um, it's tough because you know you kind of have to support uh, a limited number of use cases to keep things maintainable. So okay. if you really want to do QCAL out two files, uh, you can use a, a sidecar. Uh, um, what do we call it? A, a hook. Yeah. Um, where you change the actual device specification in the uh, domain XML. Um, I think that's what uh, NVIDIA is doing uh, in their setup. So. Yeah, let me see if I, I was just looking at an example of this. So let me see if I can uh, if I can pull up a link to that. Uh, and then I will share it with you. And then we're kind of getting to be at time here. But I found there is a, a cool one. Uh, yeah, so this is from Petr Horacek. I'm going to share with you. Uh, actually, I'll just open it and whoops. Uh, and I'll share this link. But uh, this is actually uh, the code implemented uh, to do it. And you're basically creating a sidecar container. And then you use these annotations, hooks, kubevert.io. You say what the image is that you want to be uh, added as a sidecar. I think this has to be enabled by a feature gate, by the way. Um, and then you can, this particular hook uses this parameter, which is specified as an annotation on the VM. And then uh, it will, you can, if you look at this repo, you can see how it works. So um, you can, you have the opportunity uh, to receive the domain XML before it's passed down to libvert and modify it. So you can do whatever you want to the XML. Got it. Well, thank you. A lot of things which I have to dig about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and we'd love to we'd love to hear your feedback on all on all this stuff. So as we, we definitely appreciate all that. So um okay, I'll helpful. keep you updated. Thank you. Cool. All right. So we did not get around to uh CDI issue triage uh today. I don't want to dive in here uh since we're a little bit over time anyway. Um so I will just say thanks everyone for joining and for the great discussions. And well, we'll see you here at the next one. Thanks. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.